The alien scum murdered my son, so humanity will burn their worlds to ashes. Paul Adams gripped the edge of his desk, knuckles white, as the Vorkarian general's words crackled through the comlink. The human diplomat had been in the middle of tense trade negotiations on the Vorkarian homeworld when the emergency transmission came through. Now his universe was shattered. His youngest son, David, only eight years old, had been brutally killed by Vorkarian radicals, opposed to the budding alliance between their species. The boy had been part of a cultural exchange program meant to foster understanding. Instead, his murder was a deliberate provocation, calculated to maximize political impact and sabotage the fragile peace process. This was no mere personal tragedy, but an act of war with catastrophic implications. Humanity and the Vorkarians were two spacefaring civilizations, tentatively building ties after generations of distrust. Some visionaries saw the potential for cooperation and progress, but many Vorkarians resented humanity's rapid technological ascent and perceived arrogance. They viewed the Alliance as a human scheme to undermine their power. As a key architect of the human Vorkarian pact, Paul had been hailed as a peacemaker by moderates on both sides, but that made him a target for radical factions, determined to plunge the two species into conflict. The Vorkarian militant group that claimed credit for his son's murder was led by a cunning fanatic named Orin. His aim was to provoke Earth into a rash act of retaliation, shattering any hope of peace. Now, as Paul struggled to process his own devastating grief, he knew billions of lives hung in the balance. He had to find a way to cool the passions for war already flaring on both sides. Failure meant a conflict that could consume entire star systems. With a supreme effort of will, Paul convinced the Earth government to refrain from launching an immediate military strike. He would take the lead in negotiating with the Vorkarians to bring his son's killers to justice. But the Earth administration warned him, if he couldn't resolve the crisis quickly, they would declare total war on the Vorkarians and burn their worlds. Paul now sat across a gleaming table from the Vorkarian leadership, fighting to restrain his own fury as he demanded they turn over Orin and his followers for trial. The aliens claimed to be searching for the militants, but Paul sensed they were dragging their feet, muttering about the difficulty of finding the radicals. Some, he suspected, even sympathized with Orin's aims, though not his methods. The Vorkarian leaders seemed to badly underestimate human resolve. Did they really think they could get away with sheltering those who had murdered a child? Before Paul could press further, an aide burst in with a portable hollow display. It showed Orin, triumphantly claiming credit for the murder in a broadcast to his followers. Worse, the radical leader declared that other human children on Vorkarian colony worlds would be targeted next. They would expel the human infestation from their space. As the Vorkarians erupted into heated argument, some dismissing the broadcast as a bluff, others clearly frightened, Paul felt a cold dread settle in his gut. He was running out of time to contain the crisis, and if he failed, the ashes of burnt worlds scattered across the stars would be his son's only memorial. Desperate for any lead that could help prevent all-out war, Paul reached out to his network of diplomatic contacts, searching for anyone who might have information on Orin and his radical faction. After hours of coded transmissions and whispered conversations, he managed to arrange a clandestine meeting with Zorin, a high-ranking Vorkarian official known to favor peace with humanity. Paul made his way through the winding streets of the Vorkarian capital, his heart pounding as he glanced over his shoulder, alert for any sign of surveillance. He finally ducked into a dimly lit alleyway where Zorin waited, his features obscured by a hooded cloak. You're taking a big risk meeting me here, Paul said, his voice low and urgent. Zorin nodded, his eyes darting nervously. I had to warn you, Orin's group. They're not just extremists. They have powerful allies within our government, allies who want to sabotage the peace process. Paul felt a chill run down his spine. What do you mean? Who's supporting them? I don't have names, Zorin said, shaking his head but I know they've been secretly funneling funds and weapons to Orin's militants. And now, now they're planning something big. An attack on your embassy and other human targets. They want to provoke a war. Paul's mind raced. 
the implications of Zoran's revelation hitting him like a punch to the gut. When? How soon? I don't know exactly, but soon. You need to get your people off Vorkarian worlds, immediately. I, I don't think my government will do anything to stop it. Paul gripped Zoran's arm, his voice intense. Come with me. Help me stop this. We can expose the truth, together. But Zoran pulled away, his eyes haunted. I... I can't. They'll kill me. And my family. You don't understand the risk. With that, Zoran turned and hurried away, leaving Paul alone in the alley, his mind spinning. Paul immediately relayed Zoran's intelligence back to Earth urging an immediate evacuation of all human civilians and diplomatic staff from Vorkarian space. But the response from Earth's military leadership was not what he had hoped. They advised against showing weakness in the face of Vorkarian aggression and insisted that Paul remain to try to dedication the crisis through diplomacy. But Paul knew that diplomacy alone would not be enough. Not anymore. With time running out, he hatched a desperate plan. He would pretend to leave as Zoran had suggested, but secretly remain behind on the Vorkarian homeworld with a hand-picked team of human special forces operatives. Their mission, to capture Orin and expose his government ties, forcing the Vorkarian leadership to confront the radical faction openly. It was a huge gamble, and Paul knew it. If he failed, war would be inevitable, and millions would likely die. His team would be alone on a hostile world, vastly outnumbered, with no official support or backup. But he saw no other choice. It was the only chance to prevent a catastrophe that could consume both their species. As the last human transport ships lifted off, carrying the evacuated civilians to safety, Paul and his team went to ground, moving from safe house to safe house as they gathered intelligence and prepared to hunt Orin down. Through whispered conversations with informants and intercepted communications, they soon learned that Oren's militants were planning to attack a human freighter that was scheduled to dock at a Vorkarian spaceport in a matter of days. But even as they planned their next move, Paul and his team faced constant danger. Oren's followers ruthlessly hunted down any humans remaining on the planet, and Paul's team narrowly survived several close calls. In one pitched street battle, Paul managed to capture one of Oren's lieutenants. Under interrogation, the captive militant confirmed Zoran's claims about the radicals' government support and revealed more about their plans to attack the freighter. With the attack imminent, Paul knew they were out of time for subtlety. In a series of tense, encrypted transmissions, he coordinated with the freighter's crew and laid out a daring plan. His team would set up an ambush at the spaceport and attempt to capture Oren in the act, proving his ties to elements within the Vorkarian government. If they failed, Paul knew, the last best chance for peace would be lost. The hours ticked by with agonizing slowness as Paul and his operatives took up concealed positions around the spaceport, hidden among the maintenance catwalks and fueling vehicles. As the freighter made its final approach, Paul's hands tightened around his weapon. Everything hinged on this moment. Just as the freighter was completing docking procedures, a sudden flurry of activity drew Paul's eye. Several nondescript Vorkarian ground vehicles were speeding toward the ship, disruptor beams already lancing out to rake across its hull. Through the haze of weapons fire, Paul caught a glimpse of a familiar face, one he had memorized from intelligence briefings. Orin, leading the charge. Go, go, go! Paul shouted into his comm, and his team burst from cover sprinting toward the attackers as the spaceport erupted into chaos. Disruptor beams sizzled through the air as Paul's operatives engaged the militants in a vicious close-quarters battle among the ships and machinery. The fighting was brutal and bloody, with bodies hitting the deck on both sides. Through the smoke and carnage, Paul spotted Orin breaking away from the melee, making a run for a small armed spacecraft on the edge of the landing pad. Gritting his teeth, Paul sprinted after him, dodging weapons fire as he closed the distance. He caught up to Orin at the base of the ship's boarding ramp. The Vorkarian radical spun to face him, eyes blazing with hate and fear. The two leaders crashed together, trading blows in a desperate hand-to-hand -hand struggle as they grappled and slammed each other against the ship's hull. But Paul's grim drive gave him the edge, 
and with a final bone-crunching effort, he drove Oren to the deck and pinned him there. The sound of rushing footsteps made Paul look up, still panting from the exertion. Vorkarian security forces were pouring into the spaceport, weapons drawn. For a moment he tensed, expecting them to turn on him. But they held their fire, confusion and uncertainty on their faces. Slowly, painfully, Paul hauled Oren to his feet, dragging the battered radical over to the security commander. All around them, camera drones darted and hovered, broadcasting the scene to the entire Vorkarian net. This male is under arrest, Paul declared, his voice raw but steady, for murder, terrorism, and treason against both our peoples. And I'm calling on the Vorkarian government to answer for its role in his crimes. He looked straight into the nearest camera drone, his gaze unwavering. The blood of my son, and so many others, is on this criminal's hands, and on the hands of those in power who aided him. The Vorkarian people have a right to the truth. No more lies. No more hate. No more war. In that moment, with his devastating accusation broadcast across the stars, Paul knew the scales had tipped. The Vorkarian leadership, human intelligence had long suspected, had at least tacitly supported Oren's faction. Now, that support was dragged into the scorching light. There would be no more the shadows. The Vorkarian government would have to either openly side with the militants and commit to a devastating war or renounce them and commit to peace. Paul had done all he could. He could only pray it would be enough to pull both species back from the brink. As he stood on that bomb-scarred landing pad, surrounded by the carnage of the battle and the whirring of countless cameras, he felt a strange calm settle over him. The grief, the anger, the desperate urgency of the past days, they all seemed to recede, leaving behind a crystalline clarity. Whatever happened next, he had made his stand, for his son, for the hope of peace. The Vorkarian leadership and the Vorkarian people would have to choose. And the future of two species, the lives of billions, would hang in the balance. The aftermath of Paul's daring operation at the spaceport sent shockwaves through Vorkarian society. Footage of Oren's capture and Paul's accusations spread like wildfire across the planet's information networks. The Vorkarian government found itself backed into a corner, forced to publicly disavow Oren and his radical faction. In a hastily arranged press conference, the Vorkarian Prime Minister declared, We condemn these heinous acts of terrorism in the strongest possible terms. Oren and his followers are criminals who will face the full force of Vorkarian justice. But Paul knew the truth. He paced in his makeshift command center analyzing intercepted communications that painted a different picture. Many in the Vorkarian leadership still harbored sympathy for the anti-human cause. We need full disclosure, Paul insisted during a tense vid call with Vorkarian officials. Every last member of Oren's network rounded up. Every official who provided support arrested and tried. And I want neutral observers overseeing the investigation. The Vorkarian representatives shifted uncomfortably. We assure you, Ambassador Adams, we are taking all necessary steps to... Not good enough, Paul cut them off. I've seen the intelligence. You're stalling, reassigning key personnel, purging records. It ends now. As the diplomats blustered and made excuses, Paul's team worked tirelessly to track Oren's remaining followers. Reports trickled in of increased chatter and movement among known radical cells. Paul sent an urgent warning to Earth. Oren's capture has only inflamed his supporters. They're planning something big. We need to act now. But the response from Earth was frustratingly dismissive. The Vorkarian government has given us assurances, Ambassador. Let's not overreact. Paul smacked his head on the desk in frustration. They didn't understand the powder keg they were sitting on. His fears were realized days later when alarms blared throughout the human embassy. Multiple attacks reported across Vorkarian space, an aide shouted. Paul sprinted to the command center, where screens showed chaos unfolding. Oren's lieutenants, sprung from custody by inside help, had launched a coordinated assault on human targets planet-wide. At the new Jakarta colony, panicked civilians fled as militant forces stormed the streets. The Ganymede Research Station sent out frantic distress calls as explosions rocked its foundations. Get me a secure link to Earth now, 
Paul barked. But even as he tried to coordinate a response, the situation spiraled further out of control. Reports flooded in of casualties mounting at embassies and outposts. Paul's security teams, vastly outnumbered, fought desperate holding actions as they tried to evacuate civilians. At the Proxima Colony, Paul watched in horror as live feeds showed Oren's forces overwhelming the defenses. Civilians huddled in terror as the militants advanced, their weapons cutting down anyone in their path. The carnage unfolding across Vorkarian space was beyond anything Paul had imagined, and he knew with sickening certainty that it was only the beginning. On Earth, the response was swift and merciless. The military council, long itching for a fight, seized on the attacks as justification. Within hours, a massive war fleet assembled, dripping with planet killers and relativistic weapons. This is Admiral Zhao of Earth Fleet Command, a grim transmission announced across all frequencies. Vorkarian forces, you are ordered to stand down immediately and surrender Orin and all conspirators. Failure to comply will result in overwhelming force. But the Vorkarians, their military might dwarfed by Earth's technological superiority, had no real choice. As human warships effortlessly swatted aside their defensive fleets and began systematically bombarding military targets from orbit, the Vorkarian leadership's bravado crumbled. Please, we surrender, the Prime Minister pleaded in a desperate transmission. We'll give you everything, all our intelligence on Orin, anything you want. Just stop the attacks. Paul watched the events unfold with a mix of vindication and horror. The treachery had been exposed, but at a terrible cost. As reports of the devastation poured in, he knew that the ramifications of this conflict would echo across the stars for generations to come. The evacuation klaxons blared as Paul Adams herded the last group of human survivors onto the waiting shuttles. Disruptor fire sizzled past, scorching the launch pad, as Oren's fanatics closed in. Go! Get them out of here! Paul shouted to the pilot as he laid down covering fire. The shuttle's engines roared to life, kicking up dust and debris as it lifted off. Paul dove into the last transport, the hatch slamming shut behind him as they rocketed into the sky. Through the viewport, Paul watched Vorkarian cities shrink away, fires raging across the surface. His hands clenched as he thought of those left behind. How many more would die before this was over? The small flotilla of refugee ships rendezvoused with the human battle fleet in high orbit. Admiral Chen's face appeared on the main screen, grim and resolute. We're engaging the Vorkarian defense grid now, Chen reported. But we just got word. Orin's gone to ground. Slippery bastard gave us the slip. Paul hit his fist against the bulkhead. We can't let him escape. He'll just regroup and strike again. Agreed. What's your play, Adams? Paul's mind raced. Give me a strike team. We'll track the son of a bitch down ourselves. Within hours, Paul had assembled an elite squad and commandeered a stealth infiltrator. They pored over intelligence reports, searching for any hint of Oren's whereabouts. There, Lieutenant Reeves called out, pointing to a string of encoded transmissions. That data packet's using an old Vorkarian military cipher. Has to be them. They followed the electronic trail to a remote mountain range. As they approached under cover of darkness, Paul saw a sprawling compound nestled in a valley, dripping with defense turrets. Looks like we found Oren's hidey hole, he muttered. Prep for infiltration. We go in quiet. The team used grappling lines to scale the outer walls, taking out sentries with silenced weapons. They moved through the compound like ghosts, neutralizing patrols and security systems. In the main hall, they found rows of Vorkarian youth being indoctrinated, chanting anti-human slogans. Paul's stomach turned. This wasn't just a hideout. It was a breeding ground for the next generation of fanatics. We need to shut this down, he growled. Plant charges on the weapon caches. We'll blow this place sky high on our way out. They fought their way to the command center, mowing down waves of Orin's troops. But when they breached the final door, they found only abandoned consoles and half-eaten meals. Damn it, Paul snarled, smashing a fist into a computer bank. He's gone again. As alarms blared and reinforcements poured in, 
The team frantically searched for intel. Reeves managed to pull data from a computer core moments before they were forced to flee. Back aboard their ship, as the compound erupted in flames behind them, Reeves decrypted the files. His face went pale. Sir, you need to see this, he said, pulling up schematics for a massive ship-mounted weapon. It's some kind of supercharged plasma cannon, and Oren's planning to use it on our fleet. Paul's blood ran cold as he realized the catastrophic damage such a weapon could inflict. He opened a channel to Admiral Chen. Admiral, we've got a situation. Paul Adams lay motionless on the stark white medbay bed, his chest rising and falling in shallow, erratic breaths. The rhythmic beeping of medical monitors filled the air, punctuated by the urgent voices of doctors and nurses as they worked to stabilize him. Suddenly, Paul's body went rigid, his back arched off the bed as violent convulsions racked his frame. Alarms blared, and medical staff rushed to his side. He's seizing! Get me ten cc's of anticonvulsants, stat, barked the lead physician. A nurse frantically injected the medication into Paul's IV line as others struggled to keep him from injuring himself. After several agonizing moments, the seizure subsided, leaving Paul limp and unresponsive. Hours passed in a haze of fevered nightmares. Paul drifted in and out of consciousness, catching snippets of worried conversations and feeling ghost touches of medical instruments on his skin. During a rare moment of lucidity, Paul's eyes fluttered open to see a tall figure looming over his bed. As his vision cleared, he recognized the stern features of Admiral Chen. Ambassador Adams, Chen said, his voice low and solemn. I needed to inform you personally. Your actions, they've secured humanity's future. But the cost... Chen's words faded as a piercing alarm cut through the air. The deck beneath them shuddered violently. What's happening? Paul rasped, struggling to sit up. Chen's face paled as he glanced at a nearby view screen. On it, Paul saw hellish scenes unfolding on the Vorkarian planet below. Massive fissures tore across continents, spewing rivers of molten rock. Entire cities crumbled and sank into newly formed chasms. My God, Paul whispered, horror dawning on his face. What have I done? The view screen switched to scenes of chaos as human occupation forces scrambled to evacuate. Soldiers and civilians alike fought through debris-choked streets, choking on toxic fumes as they raced toward waiting shuttles. A woman stumbled, her legs caught in a steaming crack that opened beneath her. Her screams were cut short as she vanished into the inferno below. Paul watched, transfixed by the devastation. Each explosion, each collapsing building, each extinguished life, seared itself into his mind. The weight of his actions pressed down on him, making it hard to breathe. You saved us, Paul, Chen said, his voice strained. Remember that. But Paul couldn't tear his eyes from the screen. He saw the last human ships fleeing the doomed world, mere moments before it detonated in a cataclysmic blast that lit up space itself. As darkness crept in at the edges of his vision, Paul's mind filled with ghostly visions, the faces of countless Vorkarians, consumed by fire and ash, stared at him in silent accusation. Among them, he saw his son, eyes full of disappointment. Paul's breath came in ragged gasps as his damaged body began to shut down. The quiet beeping of the medical monitors slowed, matching the fading rhythm of his heart. In his final moments of awareness, Paul gazed out at the field of debris that was once a thriving world. The magnitude of destruction overwhelmed him. He had won the war, saved humanity, but at what terrible price? As consciousness slipped away, one last thought echoed through his fading mind. In their desperate struggle for survival, had humans become the very monsters they sought to defeat? You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.